Hey y'all, Data Guy here. And today I have a video for you that I know is another viewer request. Um, and that is, what is data modeling? How do you do it? What are some systems? What are some examples? And why do you want to use data modeling? Um, and you'll come to find out that data modeling is really just kind of at the core of whatever database you're using. And we also have a guest appearance from the data dog here today because he is being a little rascal. Um, but back to the actually scheduled content. So data modeling is really defining the structure for your database. Um, so imagine, you know, whenever you're trying to put just raw data that you're extracting from, you know, an API, maybe just information about your sales, it typically is coming in a pretty messy way. You know, it'll just be, you know, raw machine data that just says, you know, hey, this is some string of numbers and letters that represents the transaction, your, you know, hashed credit card ID, purchase amount, uh, you know, customer name, things like that. Uh, and bringing that into your database and, you know, saying, hey, I actually want to align that based on, you know, for which customer bought this. I want to maybe add that to a database I have of existing customer orders. You're going to need to have a model to define how are you joining that data into your existing database. Um, and so that is what data modeling is. And so I have up here an example kind of of uh, a relatively simple data model. Um, and just to kind of walk you through an example of, you know, hey, how does this work? And, you know, what is the initial type of data modeling? Um, before I do that, so I just high level data modeling is, you know, really it's the art and kind of the science of framing data in a manner that it makes sense, but it also can be easily manipulated and analyzed. So it's not just for, you know, making this human readable. It's also making sure that your queries are really efficient um, so that you can save money on the compute needed to actually run those queries to access the information you need when you're doing, you know, large scale analytics and the costs of, you know, going through millions and millions of lines of data uh, can become quite significant. Um, so this provides, you know, foundation for after, by having cleanly ordered data that's easily queryable, um, you can really provide a solid foundation for many different applications uh, like, you know, database design, machine learning algorithms, bringing your data directly from here, you know, into some kind of analytics platform. Um, it just makes everything you're doing on top of the data much easier if you have a very clean and structured data model. Um, and so you can kind of see here within this, it is really a conceptual representation of data objects. So, you know, obviously this is, you know, these are gonna be different tables within a database, but at a high level, you're gonna to wanna, to, you know, kind of diagram it out to make sure, hey, do these relationships between, you know, payments being linked to the order object make sense? Um, and is that like logically where I'm typically gonna to need to get the payment information from by querying that order header? Or maybe it should be under customer because, you know, I wanna look at all the customer's payment information. And so that's kind of a choice, you know, this user has made where they have payments being linked directly to order header rather than by customer. But there is a customer ID um, within the payment uh, object. Um, and so, you're looking at you know, not only the representation of the data objects, the relationships between them, the rules governing these relationships. So, you know, you don't, the rule that, hey, maybe in this, you never put payment information in the customer object. Um, and it's really just a blueprint for as you build and ingest data, uh, guiding the structure of the data in kind of you know, a systematic and standardized way. Um, so just to kind of walk you through what this data model is here, so then I can talk about maybe some of the example applications and why it's useful. Um, so here we have, you know, the base, object or maybe your, you know, order header. So every time, you know, customer makes an order, there's an order header, which has an order ID, uh, order date, order time, customer ID, which links to the customer and all the information about them that they purchase this for. It also has a linkage to the delivery ID. And so it's actually not the delivery ID references the order ID. So order ID doesn't reference the delivery ID because typically if we're looking at delivery information, we're not, or we're just going to need the order ID from there. But if we're looking at the order header information, we're not going to typically need the delivery information because maybe we're just looking at the payment. And this is one of those decisions that, hey, you know, I didn't make it, but someone made this decision to say, you know, we don't actually need delivery ID in order header to save space on storing that twice. Um, because some of these fields like customer ID here under payment uh, and in here you have PK. So within each um, table, you'll have a primary key. And what that is, is the totally unique identifier for each object. So there can no, be no duplicate customer IDs within this table. And the, cust the primary key here is how you can reference this table. Um, so here, customer ID referencing customer here. Uh, but this is basically your single source of truth that, hey, 
every customer is going to have a unique ID. Every payment's going to have a unique ID there and a primary key. Every order ID is going to be unique. Um, and maybe, you know, two people made the same order on the same time, but they're going to be distinguished by their different order IDs. Um, even if a customer made an order twice, you know, maybe they fat fingered, clicked it twice, they're still going to have two separate order IDs to differentiate them. Um, and then we hear under order line, you know, you have uh, primary key line ID, which is a foreign key. So this means it matches a primary or uh, alternate key inherited from another table. So this means that this key isn't actually present in all of this information. So this is being pulled in from a line informa information. You know, maybe that's the head database where it actually just stores all the different orders um, separately. And so that's if you need to bring information from a separate database, you can use foreign keys um, that will match another unique identifier. So line ID will have to be unique in another table that this is uh, pulling from. Then over here, you now have the product ID with the product uh, unique identifier name and specification because you know that's all the information you need about a product because many people are going to be buying it, many people are going to be referencing it. Um, so you don't need a lot of unique information there other than each product is obviously its own type. And so that was actually only one type of data model. Um, you also that was the relational model. Um, so with the relational model, it is you know, you have concept of relations, which are represented by different tables. And so tables are used to store data, establish the relationships between those different data elements. So by primary key referencing each other, and it's widely used because it's relatively simple to set up. Um, it has really powerful uh, query abilities as well. Um, you also have object oriented data models. Um, and so object oriented data models combine data and the operations that can be formed on data, like extracting um, into a model. And so this is really useful in applications where you need, you know, real world representation of your data with complex relationships and operations where you have, you know, maybe not a large amount of objects, but each of those objects has to store a lot of different state changes. Um, you know, maybe it represents you know, maybe an AI model um, that has, you know, all, actually, no, that wouldn't make any sense. Sorry. Maybe it represents like the ingestion of a, or the robotics of a car factory robot. Um, and all the tons of crazy information about um, all the different operations it's performing. Um, you also have network data models. And so these kind of are an extension of this hierarchical data models, which are basically just a tree-like structure. So you can see here, kind of looks like a tree. Um, each record has a single parent and se zero or several children. Um, and this is kind of an earlier uh, database system where you didn't really have uh, a lot of data. So, you know, you'd have like, hey, this company has this many users. And then you kind of have, you know, like almost like a leadership chart of each manager has this uh, several uh, people under it. But it really has limitations when, you know, you want to represent many, many relationships, you know, maybe the relationships between using that kind of worker analogy, like relationships between coworkers, you couldn't do that. It'd have to go through their manager. Um, and so that's where you had the network uh, model come in where you have multiple parent records for each child. Um, so you can have, you know, one child is linked to many different p parents and that kind of allows you to represent more complex relationships and, you know, kind of work around the limitations of the hierarchical data model, but wouldn't say it's super popular these days. Um, th then there's also the entity relationship model, which is uh, widely used in database design. And that's where you have entities, attributes, relationships among the entities, helping you to kind of have a really clear uh, logical view of the data. So to you, here you have kind of an example of that where it is, you know, almost just like a mapping of relationships between things. So here you have an address name affiliation for like a bank branch. You have withdrawals, account number, balance, deposits, account, which also inherits from account balance. Um, and this is, you know, great for when just have a lot of different things that all relate to each other. Um, so maybe not, or not a lot, but a relatively small amount of things that have really defined relationships um, that you are, you know, know are going to happen. So, you know, you're always going to have to go to a deposit or draw from a bank. It's always going to be a, a, you know, user that does that. Um, and just having that very clear model to understand how your data is flowing makes it easy to process, collect, and then, you know, query down the road. Um, so really, you know, just easy to look at when you compare it to maybe something like that, uh, a relational data model where it does take, you know, a little bit of kind of thought uh, conceptualization to really get, get them.
And so those are kind of like all of the different, you know, actual data models, you know, in terms of implanting, there's also things like conceptual and logic, logical data models that are just high level representations of your data, but that's not really what you'll be using in practice uh, if you're implementing data modeling, unless you're just visualizing it to an external stakeholder. Um, so some of the applications of data modeling kind of moving on now. And so now to kind of bring it all together, you know, how is data modeling used in the real world? So there's a conceptual data model right at the top. And that's really just the business view of understanding, you know, how data is flowing through your business, how it's going from, you know, your front end applications, whether you're, you know, a bank or uh, an applicant, you know, and you like someone like Facebook collecting information about their users, um, understanding how that information is collected, stored, and then used. Um, so it helps you, you know, so some of the benefits of this, you know, you have database design, um, helps you to, you know, identify the right data structure, understand, hey, this is the type of data we're collecting. These are the types of things we want to do with it. And so data modeling allows you to define the relationships of, hey, how are we bringing it from that raw data into usable data that then can be easily used by um, our developers? So that's kind of the architect's job, figuring that out. Um, and then this ensures, you know, obviously data integrity and accuracy, make sure that if we're doing things like AI, ML, that we're actually training our model on relevant data and not just completely screwing it up and setting ourselves up for failure by making inaccurate predictions. Uh, and, you know, kind of hand in glove with this, you have data analysis, um, you have, you know, bringing your data from back, its backend databases into BI or analytical applications for you know people to actually gain insights from all the data that you're painstakingly modeling all day um, you know it doesn't mean anything if no one's actually using it for anything um, and so this provide data modeling provides a clear structure for analyzing that data and aiding you in making easier and better uh, decisions you also have application development um, so understanding hey how is our data going to be used in applications so you can look at you know your transaction operation applications management of that understanding you know, how you're storing your uh, transactional information to just kind of use the example here um, and ensures that the data that you're handling from your applications is accurate and consistent. So you're not storing inaccurate data around you know, your purchasing patterns so that you're then you know, not misled about what your customers are actually buying. Um, and then also at kind of a more, uh, I guess, boring level, provides data governance. Um, so gives you a common vocabulary, clear understanding of, hey, this is where all of our data is stored by having that mapping out of, you know, hey, this is where all of our data is, what types of data we're storing, where it's stored, what, you know, security measures are taken on that data. And that can also help you in compliance with any kind of standards and regulations. And obviously for any kind of financial institution, that's really crucial. Um, or any GDP com compliant or GDPR compliant organization as well, um, because the Europeans love, love uh, protecting personal data, which is awesome. And so to kind of like guide you through a typical workflow you're going to be going through when you're establishing data modeling, um, number one, conceptual modeling, which is just really getting the high level uh, insight of what is the data we're working with? What do we want to do with it? What do we need to store? What can we prune maybe as we ingest it? What do our and business user stakeholders, so the executives need to see in their analysis or in their reports, uh, making sure that that data is stored properly, collected properly, um, and defining how it's gonna be used for our analytics uh, engineers or just analytics data scientists to actually produce those reports easily without them needing to constantly come to us and ask us, oh, actually we need to do, change this and do that and blah, 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 blah. Um, so this also involves conceptual data modeling. So, you know, as I said, high represent, uh, level representation based on those stakeholder requirements, um, not really very technical, more something that you'll want to present to, you know, someone that doesn't really understand databases, but understands what that data needs to be used for. Then after you've gotten all that set up, you'll then want to go into the logical data modeling section and develop a really detailed technical model uh, that includes your attributes, primary keys, foreign keys, the relationships between different tables, and, you know, just really map it all out in actual technical detail uh, and also understand, you know, hey, what is the kind of data we're ingesting, what are the attributes of that data, um, and really just set yourself up for success when you actually start ingesting it. And when you're going to start ingesting it and set up, actually build your database is in the physical modeling stage. So you're not actually going to build a database from scratch. It's not hardware, but you are going to be creating your database schema based on that logical model. So designing, you know, the schema and all the different relationships between those databases and then optimize, you know, for performance, indexing, partitioning, maybe uh, sharding in different databases, whatever you need to do there 
uh, do it before you actually start ingesting the data so you don't have to move around data after. And then finally, you'll actually create the database and start uh, uploading your business data. But then the kind of hidden fifth step is maintenance. Um, so you're going to have to deal with things like data change capture over time. And may, you know maybe sometimes, hey, executive says, I actually need to get this pie graph up. You'll have to go there and change your data model uh, to actually reflect that. So you're going to need to make sure you document everything, uh, make sure everything is human readable, legible, that you can go back and make any changes uh, easily rather than having to you know comb through spaghetti code and technical debt. And so... Because data modeling, you know, it's obviously you're not going to take your data model and just like paste it into a database. You're going to just use a data modeling tool really to kind of visualize. So any design tool that you're already using, you can probably use for data modeling. But there are also some dedicated tools for this. Um, so the most popular one is ER Studio. Um, and this actually lets you plug into your databases and kind of identify them, um, identify, you know, relationships between your data. But it also allows you to, you know, design yourself within your uh, data modeling tool. You also have uh, DB schema, so schema documentation, monitoring, scaring schemas on relational and NoSQL databases. You can quickly you know, copy and paste complex schemas for if you want to replicate a database from one to another. Um, you also have Erwin data modeling. So this is creating a database from a physical model and actually does allow you to interpret you know, what your specifications were um, and create a database. So kind of remove some of the steps I and mean, you still have to write out all the different uh, steps in your physical model. But instead of just kind of doing the double work, you can, if you do it right format in order initially, it'll automatically apply it and build that database. Um, if it's compatible, of course, you also have Archie, uh, which is, you know, cheap solution, which allows you to just visualize uh, and describe architecture. Um, so just pure visualization tool, SQL database modeler. Um, and this is, again, you can build a model within, uh, see it within SQL database modeler, and then use it to build a corresponding SQL database. Um, you also have Oracle SQL data modeler if you're still using Oracle databases. Um, and then IBM Infosphere data architect, which is really built for, you know, business intelligence, simple uh, and statistics. So really good for, you know, if you're not super, you know, data engineering focused, and you're just want to say, hey, how are we ingesting data and then bringing them into our analytics platforms. Uh, MySQL Workbench, so just, you know, nice open source figure, you know, allows you to construct models um, for MySQL. However, I hate working with MySQL, so I'm not even going to touch that. Um, Lucidchart, this is, you know, just nice collaborative online tools. So if you're working with many different people, you have a large team, uh, there's a lot of different features that you can use um, within Lucidchart. And, you know, it's all cloud-based, so you guys can collaborate on your models together. And then you also have PG Modeler, which is Open, another open source tool, so gotta have work the open source tools in um, that has complete access to its source code, and it's just you know super easy way to write a model for uh, PG or for post uh, PG SQL Postgres SQL databases, um, and yeah, so that's kind of all I have for you today. Um, I just really wanted to go into kind of everything around data modeling per that viewer request and just talk about it because data modeling is really indispensable in the modern world. Uh, it's the bedrock upon all of your data, all of, you know, even data quality is built on top of data models, allows you to do actual insightful analytics, effective use of data in your applications, and just really brings a lot of clarity and organization to data management. So it can really be valuable in a ton of different sectors. Um, and I hope that you found this video helpful for, you know, identifying what you want to do for data modeling strategy. Um, and so, Data Guy, signing off. Um, and if you have any ideas for future videos, any other topics you want to see explained, drop them in the comments below and I'll get to it. Uh, peace. Data Guy out.